Today we're talking about prayer in the heart of God. So I've been reading Charles Spurgeon's book, Spiritual Warfare, Prayer and Spiritual Warfare. And I've also been reading through the book of First John in the Bible. And today, as I was doing my Bible study, those two books just intersected so much. So I decided to do a podcast and to just tell you all the treasures, all the good stuff that I'm gleaning from what I'm reading. Hey, it's Amber, wife, mother, type A child of God. Here are little things we look at everyday issues from a biblical perspective with one simple goal, to know and love God more. Thanks for listening. So first of all, the book of 1 John, the book of the Bible, is written by the Apostle John, who was one of Jesus' three friends that comprised the inner circle, Peter, James, and John went with Jesus many of the places that the rest of the disciples weren't able to go. So that's who wrote the book of 1 John. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, John addresses if your heart condemns you. So in other words, if your sin is making you feel guilty and your conscience is overwhelming, he's saying if your heart condemns you, you have somebody that takes care of it and that somebody is Jesus Christ. So as soon as he gets done explaining that, he goes into verses 21 and following, which say this. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, and they don't because we have Jesus, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commands us. Those who obey his commands live in him, in he, in them. Okay, what is this saying? First of all, it's saying when it comes to prayer, we have to go through Jesus. There's no other way to get to God the Father except through Jesus. That's our ticket in. So in the Behind the Series podcast that I did with Pastor Mike Novotny in December, we started talking about... Um, One of the sermons he had talked about the Holy of Holies and getting there. And the point being that in the temple in the Old Testament, there were different sections of of the temple and people could go to different sections. So there were different courtyards and so many people could go here. And in this part of the temple, the priests could go and they could minister before the Lord. But there was one area, it was called the Most Holy Place or the Holy of Holies. And that was where the Ark of the Covenant with things like the... um, the tablets that were the Ten Commandments. Um, There was some manna in there. There was Aaron's budding staff. The Ark of the Covenant was in the most holy place, and that's where the presence of God dwelt. No one could go into that place except for the high priest once a year, and he had to bring blood. He couldn't just walk in there whenever he wanted. One day on the Day of Atonement, he was allowed to go to the most holy place on behalf of the people with blood to pay for their sins. So fast forward to when Jesus died on the cross. So at that point, there was a huge curtain which hung right in front of the Holy of Holies. So it was, we said, we were talking about it was a hand breath. It was like five, six inches thick. And because it was that thick, it couldn't just tear easily. And so uh, at the very moment when Jesus died, that curtain tore from top to bottom. And it happened because Jesus paid for our sin. And so God the Father was saying, in essence, look, there's now nothing that stands before between me and my people. My people are able to go into my presence at any time now. There is one little thing, though. We can, as long as we believe in Jesus as our Savior. So if you're praying to God, but you don't believe that Jesus was anything but a teacher, or if you don't believe he was anything special, or if you don't believe his death meant anything, if you think he was just a normal human being who died a normal human death, um, you don't have access to the presence of God. Because in order to get to God, we must come in the name of Jesus. He's the gate. He's the way. He's, He's how we get there. And in fact, Charles Spurgeon in Prayer and Spiritual Warfare put said it like this. As prayer will not truly, will not be truly prayer without the Spirit of God, so it will not be prevailing prayer without the Son of God. He, the great high priest, must go within the veil for us. 
No, through his crucified person, the veil will be entirely taken away. Until then, we are shut out from the living God. The man who, despite the teachings of scripture, tries to pray without our Savior, insults the deity. If a person imagines that his own natural desires coming up before God, unsprinkled with the precious blood, will be acceptable sacrifice before God, he makes a mistake. He has not brought an offering that God can accept any more than if he had struck off a dog's head or offered an unclean sacrifice. Worked in us by the Spirit, presented for us by the Christ of God, prayer becomes power before the Most High, but not by any other way. There's one way to get to God. If you want God to hear your prayers, there's only one way, and that's through Jesus Christ, his son, because Jesus made the way to God the Father. So that's the first thing that we have to understand. Now, what's the significance of Jesus being the one who made the way for us? Why does that matter? Well, Jesus is the son of God, the all-powerful, almighty God, And as um, Charles Spurgeon said, you know, there's, there's nothing that we can do. We cannot come to the deity apart from him. But I think that this is something really, really important. Charles Spurgeon gave me an image that really made this crystal clear why this is important that I go in Jesus' name. Not just because he is the way. That's the most important thing. I can't get to God the Father without him. But look at what we have access to when we go in Jesus' name. He says this. This is virtually what Jesus Christ says to us. If you need anything from God, all the Father has belongs to me. Go and use my name. Suppose that you give a man your checkbook signed with your own name and left blank to be filled in as he chooses. That would be very close to what Jesus has done in these words. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If I had a good name at the bottom of the check, I would be sure that it would be cashed when I went into the bank with it. So when you have got Christ's name, to whom the very justice of God has become a debtor and whose merits have claims with the Most High, when you have Christ's name, there's no need to speak with fear and trembling and bated breath. Oh, waver not, and let not faith stagger. When you plead the name of Christ, you plead that which shakes the gates of hell, and that which the hosts of heaven obey. And God himself feels the sacred power of that divine plea. So the Apostle John said, you can, when you go with confidence before God, in Jesus' name, receive from him anything we ask. Now, I know what you're thinking. Hmm, interesting. I have prayed many prayers, and sometimes they aren't coming true, or I haven't seen them actually come to pass yet. So how can you say that if I just pray in Jesus' name, I can get anything? Well, James, who was Jesus' half-brother, he had this to say in James 4, verse 3. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So James is saying, hey, you know, it's an important thing to really take stock of what your motives are, because a lot of times we ask for things with wrong motives. So you might be going, oh, I don't think I do, Amber. I just want God to heal my friends or my relatives, or I want, you know, peace in our family. What's so wrong about that? Nothing necessarily, but you know, we're all going to go to heaven eventually. So instead of just praying for healing for our relatives or our friends, pray that they really know who Jesus is and pray that they walk with God and that their faith is strengthened and that they are able to glorify God in this and through this. So often we just want the benefit without really being able to testify to God's good name. I was thinking today as I was just reading 1 John and I was was going through all this in my mind, I was thinking if I didn't have to work, if I didn't need a paycheck, would I really actually go hang out at the nursing home any amount of time? No. And yet by me being there, I'm able to minister to the weary, the weak, the dying on a 
you know, three time a week basis. So, so often we just want what's comfortable and easy and makes our life more enjoyable or pleasurable here. And that's what our prayers become. Instead of saying, hey God, how can I work more effectively in your kingdom? How can I be the most used to you? How can I do something that will bring somebody else closer to you today? Our motives are weighed by God. So yeah, when we go before the throne of God in the name of Jesus, Jesus has everything. He has access to anything. And it's like that blank check that's just cashed or or has Jesus' name on the bottom. So we have at our disposal anything. But ask yourself, why are you praying that way? And is there a better way to pray? Now, there's another part to this too. And I think it's super, super important because John says this. Do what pleases him. Obey his commands and do what pleases him. This is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commands us. How does God command us to love one another? We just finished the series on the Ten Commandments. And if you remember, the first three commandments are about loving God. And the last seven commandments are about loving our neighbor and how God expects us to live with those around us, unbelievers, believers, our neighbors, our friends, people we don't know, everybody who we come in contact with. And this is super important to God. It isn't always super important to us, but it is super important to God. So in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, God, Jesus said this. If you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. Jesus was saying, look, we all think about, oh, giving our offerings and making sure we're giving to the Lord and that's important and that's good and it's good to, you know, keep that on the forefront. Like we don't want all our money just to go to what we want and to spend it all on ourselves. We want to give a portion of what we have to God and to his work. But Jesus said, (laughs) If you have a strained relationship, if there's a major argument going on in your life right now, don't worry about the gift. Go work out that relationship. Work on that. Make sure that is where it's supposed to be, and then you can come back and offer your gift later. Now, I don't think we take this all that seriously all the time. And when I went through the Ten Commandments, I mentioned over and over and over again, like every time I went through another commandment, I was like, guys, this is so much deeper than we usually think. Like when we're talking about authority in the fourth commandment, this is, this is serious. This is super easy to put down our authority, whether it's our boss or the people who are governing our country or our city or our state or whatever. It's like super easy to talk against them. Eighth commandment, how we use our tongue. And if we're encouraging people and building them up, or if we're you know, tearing them down in front of other people. There is so much to this. And yet this is super important to God. And Charles Spurgeon said this in a way that really struck me. So I had to highlight it because I thought this is important. He said, acknowledge the evil of sin. Ask God to make you feel it. You ever done that? Have you ever asked God to make you feel the evil of sin? to help you to acknowledge the sin in your life. Do not treat it as trifle, for it is not. To redeem the sinner from the effects of sin, Christ himself had to die. And unless you are delivered from sin, you must die eternally. Therefore, do not play with sin. Do not confess it as though it were some venial fault that would not have been noticed unless God had been too severe but labor to see sin as God sees it, as an offense against all that is good, a rebellion against all that is kind. See it to be treason, to be ingratitude, to be a low and base thing. This whole book, Prayer and Spiritual Warfare, is asking us to really think about our prayer life and in there 
Spurgeon is saying confession has to be the first part of us going to God in prayer because we need to acknowledge our own sinfulness and then go in Jesus' name. And, you know, when we confess our sins in church on Sunday, we babble a lot of times this little paragraph that we're given either in our hymnal or on a screen. And a lot of times we do it without even seriously thinking about our sins and what we do that is offensive to God. And both John and Jesus and Charles Spurgeon say, hey, um, you should take your sin seriously. You should really think about this because it affects your prayer life and it affects your worship life. And something else that Charles Spurgeon said that really hit home for me is he was saying, you know, when you pray, you really have to pray thy will be done. And in part, it's because of this. You know, when we're praying for God to reconcile us to somebody else, when we're having a, a dispute with our, our relative or a friend or a coworker, and it's straining us and we're stressed out about it, it's super easy to be praying, oh God, you know, help them to love me or help them to see the error of their ways or, you know, let them come to a point of recognizing what they're doing and how it's affecting me. There's two sides to every story. And it's super easy to see their sin without ever recognizing our own. And because of that, we have to remember when we go before the throne of God, that again, what James said, our motives are all open to God. He sees what's in our heart and he sees what we have said. He sees what we have done. So when we're going and pointing to the other person like, God, fix them, God, fix them. He may be sitting up there going, And who's going to fix you? And when are you going to acknowledge your part in this? And so Spurgeon says this. Your will be done, my Lord, is what we should pray. And if I ask anything that is not in accordance with your will, my inmost will is that you would be good enough to deny your servant. I will take it as a true answer if you refuse me if I ask what does not seem good in your sight. Isn't that beautiful? See, so often we only know a part of the story. We don't know how the other person is hurting or what's going on in their life. And so when we're praying before God, we really need to pray your will be done. And we need to pray for spiritual outcomes. Things like that people walk more closely with God that they take their faith seriously, that we glorify God, that this works to advance God's kingdom, that somehow, some way, God would give us fertile ground to plant the seeds of his word. There's so many spiritual things that we can pray when we pray and then knowing that God sees our heart, knowing that God sees our no- our motives, and knowing that God will answer our prayers in the way that is best for everyone. I'm just thoroughly, thoroughly enjoying my time in Charles Spurgeon's book. And I love it when it, what I'm reading on the side complements the very part of scripture that I'm studying so I can think more deeply about my spiritual life and so that I can really be at a point in my faith walk where I am honoring God and I am taking my sin seriously, and I am thinking about that and the way that my sin affects other people and how I can remedy that, things that I can do. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did because this is definitely getting to be something that I'm super enthusiastic about and prayer will probably come up several more times in the upcoming episodes because it is so exciting to read about and learn about and think about in a way that I probably haven't either before or for a long time. This has been Little Things, because in God's kingdom, the little things are the big things.